diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI, working out in the workplace. Dr. Ella Washington is founder and CEO of Elevate Solutions and a professor of practice at Georgetown University's McDonough School of Business. Hello, Dr. Washington. Hello, thank you for having me today. And thank you very much for being with me. Do you feel is DEI, diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion, is it front and center as a priority in the workplace today? So I think that's an interesting question. Um, I would say that it has certainly been moved higher up uh, for executives in, in terms of their priorities. I wouldn't say it's front and center um, as it should be. I do think it should be front and center. I think since 2020, we've seen a lot of growth and uptick in the conversations, but also in some companies' actions around diversity, equity, and inclusion. But I think, you know, uh, with the ebb and flow of business, with the, the challenge of having many strategic priorities, sometimes DEI does not get the attention that it deserves. And I think it's because many leaders don't understand that when your employees feel more included, when there are environments that foster diversity of thinking and diversity of experience, you actually get more from your teams. You get higher organizational and team performance, and you're more likely to have people stay in your organization. And so DEI is actually a very important business imperative, but sometimes leaders don't make that uh, tight connection. Mm -hmm. And therefore, sometimes it's not as center of a priority as it should be. Yeah, I was wondering, I mean, with employers having to pay more attention to employees' preferences and in the hybrid work environment in the during the pandemic, that might rise in consideration. But for that matter, how is DEI being managed in a hybrid work environment where people are sometimes working remotely, sometimes they're in the office? Does it make a difference? So it's interesting because data that I've connect, uh, collected in partnership with the Future Forum organization um, has found that, you know, during the pandemic specifically, those months that people were working from home a lot in a virtual environment or hybrid environment, a lot of people, especially underrepresented groups, actually felt more included. Um, and so that was curious information because it's like, well, why is it that when we're away from the office, we feel more included? Well, part of it is because there are things that happen and especially when you're from an underrepresented group in the workplace, like microaggressions or feelings of discrimination that people weren't experiencing at home because they were in the safety of their home. They were able to kind of disengage more quickly. As soon as that meeting is over, you can click mm -hmm. off the link. You don't have to continue to um, be in con community with people um, if you don't want to. Now, the downside of that is what's the long-term impact on feeling connected with the team? So I think that mm -hmm. You know, leaders have to be thoughtful, even though short term people may feel more comfortable. You have to make sure that they're also feeling connected. And I think organizations that have been thoughtful about uh, driving those connections in a hybrid and virtual work environment have done really well with maintaining that sense of connectivity, um, especially when they've done they've done things like encourage one on one conversations with managers and direct reports, um, encourage office time being very specific around what activities are being done. So not just going in the office for the sake of it, but making sure when my team is in the office, we're having face-to-face -face meetings and brainstorming conversations mm -hmm. or even um, you know team outings as opposed to just going into the office and still working in our silo desk areas. Um, yeah. And so those are some things that I think organizations that have been thoughtful are doing really well around inclusion in those hybrid and inflexible environments. And it's critically important because, you know, hybrid is not going anywhere for the near future. And so we have to be thinking about not only how we maximize the opportunity to have more flexible and more dispersed teams, but also to make sure those teams stay connected and people are feeling included. Okay. So, the, the, I mean, we're talking now already about best practices for ensuring inclusion. And one of them, as you're saying, is this idea of balancing the presence of the employer in the workplace, bringing them in and having them be there face to face. Because I would think, I mean, you said the downside is if you're not in the office, if other people are in the office and you're not, something's going on there that you're not privy to and you're not being included. And so yeah. I guess you're saying this face-to-face -face connection on a regular basis. And what would you do? Would you have these periodic meetings? Would you bring the people into the office on a, on a regular basis? How would you make sure they do stay connected? Well, there's a few things that you're touching on there. So one, if you're feeling like you're missing out on what's happening in the office, um, that should not be the case, right? So if we're going to have true hybrid work environments, 
we must make sure that those folks on Zoom don't feel disconnected from the meeting that we're having, right? And I know mm -hmm. that's hard. I mean, we've all been in those hybrid situations and we're like, why are we even doing hybrid? The technology is not working. They can't hear us. So we don't feel like they're a part of the conversation. So if you're truly going to have a hybrid work environment, you got to invest in the technology and you have to make sure the experience is equitable for everyone. Employees who are working in that virtual space should not be punished in any way or feel more excluded. And that's difficult, I acknowledge, but you got to put the time in if you're really going to have that hybrid uh, workplace. Mm -hmm. um, but to that, that later point around making sure when we're together, we're doing things that kind of elevate our community connection is really important. And so um, I don't know that it's a matter of specific frequency, like once a week or twice a month per se. But it should be based on the needs of the work. So does the work you are doing as a team require that brainstorming time that's better live and in person? Or are we making sales calls all day? So when we come together, we should just be kind of downloading as a team and connecting as a team. Um, but we really do our best work in silos. Like every uh opportunity is going to be different, but it should be right size for the type of work that your team does and what makes them most successful. Mm -hmm. Now, I imagine if we were to poll businesses and ask them about their commitment to DEI, I would guess that the number of companies that said, yes, we do have a commitment to DEI would be roughly 100%. That doesn't mean they are. <laughs> you know, we have this concept of virtue signaling, don't we, about, you know, yeah, we are committed, everyone's favorite word. How then are employers and senior leaders to be actually measured in their DEI efforts? So it's really important to have metrics for progress and success. I am a firm believer of what gets measured gets done. It's that age old business concept and it applies to DEI as well. Oftentimes people think, well, we're talking about like the human side of the workplace. So how do you measure that? There are so many ways that you can have both quantitative and qualitative metrics around DEI. Maybe on your inclusion, you're thinking about a culture or engagement survey that can get at the pulse of how people are feeling. Maybe if your efforts are around diversity specifically, you're tracking your demographic numbers year over year, not just in recruitment and hiring, but also attrition. You know, mm -hmm. when you are welcoming women or underrepresented uh, minority groups, are they staying? for the same amount of time or are they leaving at higher rates? And so those are types of things that you can easily track. I mean, there's so much data capability in today's world that we have to kind of be very intentional about how to use it. Sometimes we can have data overload. And so the data is there. It's mm -hmm. being intentional about connecting the data points that you have with the outcomes that you're curious about or that you're striving towards. And so yeah, but, but setting it's not, metrics it's and tracking. I'm saying it's not just a numbers game, though, is it? I mean, don't we also have to measure the degree to which people are being offered opportunities for advancement, the degree to which they're being valued and, the, and how long they stay and how, you know, things other than just we have X number of people in our organization that that satisfies our DEI uh, metric. You don't, you don't want it to be like that, right? Certainly, but even those opportunities, you can measure that as well, right? You can mm -hmm. you can measure how many client opportunities or new engagement opportunities that you're giving. Like, it's just a matter of being intentional about collecting that data, right? If you don't mm -hmm. have the data there or you don't have specific practices in place to make sure that everyone has the same access to opportunity, then those are some of the informal things that kind of slide under the radar. So you're absolutely right. And what I would challenge organizations to do is to... to uh, be innovative around how they're making sure they're tracking some of those informal mechanisms, because that's truly where equity comes in. It's not just in the hiring and promotion. It's right. in those everyday experiences that some employees get more exposure or opportunities for leadership okay. or opportunities for, you know, business development mm -hmm. than other employees. And pay scale. Um, you know, you mentioned the ebb and flow of interest and commitment to DEI and the fact that maybe in times that are really tough, like we've faced recently, companies might be taking their eye off the ball a little bit, claiming that, well, we're just struggling to survive right now. We have labor availability problems. We can't even find people, let alone address DEI. How do you keep up a commitment to DEI in such times? 
So first of all, you know, it's great to have resources for DEI, but resources also come in the form of time, not just money. And so many companies think like, oh, we don't have money to hire this year, so we won't be able to focus on DEI. That's not true. There are so many things that you can do on a, a regular basis to make sure that people feel included or you're maximizing the diversity that you do have and you're not losing traction by losing those diverse um, candidates that you already have either in your pipeline or within your organization. I think your inkling is right. You know, we do see from a data perspective that when there are economic downturns, as we are likely entering into 2023, we do see a lot more organizations kind of take their eye off the ball. We saw it at the beginning of 2020 when COVID-19 was first starting and led to a lot of financial uncertainty across the world. Uh, diversity, uh, officers were one of the number one roles being cut um, yeah. at the beginning of 2020. Now it tripled by the end of 2020. And there's some data on Glassdoor that's very interesting on this because of the racial reckoning that happened. But it shouldn't take a racial reckoning or any other type of reckoning for us to start to pay attention to these issues. Ultimately, if DI is your first thing to go when you're you're hitting economic hardship, that means it's really not a, a top priority because just like you wouldn't slash your, your budget for marketing um, or another important um, imperative for your business, if you think of DI as imperative to your business, you, you find ways to continue to prioritize it, even if resources are scarce. Yeah. Dr. Ella Washington of Elevate Solutions, I want to thank you so much for these great insights into how companies can keep up and make good on their commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you very much for being with me. Thanks so much for having me.